Welcome everybody to Turning Off the Toxic Tap, today's Bioneers panel. I'm hoping that today's panel is going to inform, um, surprise, and inspire you with uh, information and the stories you're going to hear today. Uh, my name is Rick Reed. I've been a philanthropist and an activist for going on 25 years now. And today we're going to talk about it, uh, climate change and the driver of climate change, which is obviously fossil fuel use and how we might turn off that toxic fossil fuel tap. Now, uh, before I introduce our other panelists, I'm just going to give some opening remarks uh, about fossil fuels in general. We're in an interesting time. Um, in many ways, big oil is in financial trouble. You know, just a decade ago, if you look at the S&P, the fossil fuel industry made up 30% of that whole index. Uh, today, like 3%. And in the US, because of fracking and fracking technology, we're experiencing an incredible gusher of oversupply of oil and gas. Supply and demand, that means that the price is low. So that means that the industry has real trouble maintaining profitability. And it's attempting to gain profitability in a few ways that each of our panelists today is going to talk about. One of those ways is to take natural gas, which is very cheap here, liquefy it and export it to Europe where it's much more expensive. So that would be a very profitable proposition if they could pull that off. Uh, likewise, uh, they are, um, and, and one of our panelists um, today, uh, Becca Inahosa is going to talk about that. And uh, another way they're trying to maintain profitability, in fact, this is their real golden goose, is to move to uh, petrochemicals, uh, plastics manufacture using all that cheap um, natural gas. Those are both massive bets that the industry is taking. Um, liquefied natural gas, its exports, and uh, petrochemicals and plastics in order to maintain their profitability. Our first two speakers today are going to talk about how they're trying to foobar industry's plans and basically blow a gigantic hole in industry's uh, profitability and balance sheets. So our first speaker, um, Becca Inahosa, is focused on stopping LNG exports. Uh, Becca's family has uh, lived for generations on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and she's using those deep community roots uh, to uh, organize in communities where LNG export terminals are planned. And working with those frontline communities to oppose those terminals, and her work includes engaging elected officials, community members. You can imagine in Texas, where oil and gas is like the mother's milk of politics, the kind of work and the kind of uh, challenges that Becca has that she's gonna talk about overcoming today. And her work also spans working with communities in Europe who are the importers of that LNG. There's a whole bunch of community members in Europe who are trying to oppose those terminals. So it's very much a whole systems kind of approach she'll talk to us about. And um, our second speaker, Sarah Thomas, is going to des describe the massive petrochemical buildout that the oil and gas industry is attempting and how the oil and gas funder collaborative is successfully opposing that buildout. And she's got some inspiring stories to tell us in ways they're trying to essentially um, kill the industry's uh, golden goose. Uh, in essence, these are two gigantic blows against the fossil fuel industry that you'll hear about. And then I'll bat last, and I'll talk about an effort that's going on that is attempting to directly sue big oil for causing the climate crisis, and in the process, rebrand big oil um, in a way that makes them completely politically toxic. So that's our program today. First Becca, uh, then Sarah, and then me. And um, I think it's time to kick off directly with you, Becca. So take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Rick. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, share my presentation with y'all. 
Uh, my name is Becca Hinojosa, and I'm the Sierra Club's Gulf Coast campaigner. I live in Brownsville, Texas, a community that is part of the Rio Grande Valley region, uh, which is on the front lines of the U.S.-Mexico border militarization and the Gulf Coast threatened by rising sea levels. Uh, I'm currently supporting my community in resisting three fracked gas LNG export terminals, as well as other communities uh, along the Texas coastline who are speaking out against proposed crude oil export terminals. Today, I will be talking about the incredible organizing that is taking place in my community and highlighting the oil and gas export build out the Texas coastline is facing. Here's a map of just some of the new massive oil and gas export terminals proposed for the Gulf of Mexico off the shore of Texas. At the very bottom tip of Texas is the city of Brownsville, which is part of the Rio Grande Valley region. This or these orange triangles here represent the three fracked gas export terminals proposed for the Brownsville port. These projects are Rio Grande LNG, Nova LNG, and Texas LNG. I would like to emphasize that this map is only of newly proposed oil and gas offshore infrastructure. There are hundreds of pre-existing petrochemical facility, facilities dominating two thirds of the Texas coastline. Beginning in Corpus Christi, Texas, which is just over 100 miles north of Brownsville, the Blue Water Oil Terminal is being proposed where there already exists massive oil and gas infrastructure with tanker ships carrying fossil fuels overseas. The size and presence of industrial facilities along the shores just increases as you drive further up the Texas coast towards Louisiana. And right now the Rio Grande Valley currently has no refineries and we'd like to keep those beaches pristine for generations. Uh, here's a photo. Um, at the top is a photo of how the Rio Grande Valley currently looks. The region is home to a wildlife corridor that allows species to migrate from Mexico to the U.S. and a largely pristine wetland ecosystem that communities of color and indigenous people depend on for fishing and shrimping to feed their families. As I mentioned, the Rio Grande Valley region does not currently have refineries or export terminals. But if the three fracked gas export terminals are built, these lands would be bulldozed and look like like this at the bottom. 19 stories tall storage tanks, massive tanker ships that are three football fields long, tall flare stacks, and a new network of pipelines that pose serious explosion risks, which could ne negatively affect up to three miles in diameter from an explosion site. And simultaneously, our region is now facing new border walls that pose additional serious dangers. Because of the fracking boom happening in West Texas's Permian Basin, companies are racing to build these new export terminals that would pave over these important wetlands and disrupt people's health. The Permian Basin, you can see right there on the map, is one of the world's largest oil fields with more than 400 drilling rigs operating throughout the region, accounting for nearly half of the nation's total rig count. Here, roads are being overwhelmed by industry trucks carrying hazardous chemicals and fracked oil, toxic air pollutants. Uh, there's an influx of workers in man camps linked to an uptick, an uptick in violence against indigenous women and women of color, uh, sex trafficking, drug trafficking, and other crimes. Fracking companies here are feverishly drilling in these regions. Reports show that most crude is being produced, uh, more crude is being produced than refined or exported. And new terminals plan to export the oil and gas that is fracked from the Eagle Ford Shell region in South Texas and the rapidly exploited Permian Basin. So what does this fracking boom and fossil fuels corporations race to build export terminals mean for communities along the Gulf Coast? So I'm going to highlight the harms and negative impacts we face from a surge in hazardous air pollution, harmful to public health and the climate. I will touch on the threats to our ecosystem and the few pockets of natural habitat we have left for endangered species. Our community depends on a thriving ecosystem to survive. 
I also touch on the destruction to the local economy and community's way of life that the projects would cause and how the fossil fuel expansion is part of the continuous colonization of indigenous people's land. Uh, air pollution. So new oil and gas export terminals would dramatically increase toxic air pollution along the coast. These pollutants include nitrogen oxides and particulate matter, PM 2.5, which are terrible for respiratory systems and can trigger asthma. Uh, volatile organic compounds or VOCs are cancer causing toxins, toxins that are not safe at any level of exposure. And of course, a massive increase in greenhouse gases which drives climate change. And in the Rio Grande Valley in particular, the three uh, export terminals would be the largest single source emitters of toxic air pollution in the region, affecting mostly low income communities of color who have low access, currently have low access to healthcare. This is just another classic example of environmental racism. And local city officials have been known to acknowledge this fact. They have been quoted calling LNG environmental racism when they directly confront regulators on environmental health issues. Climate impacts. Oil and gas exports are part of what we call the fracked gas cycle. You can see we have a little um, graphic here. Throughout the fracked gas cycle from extraction, transmission to processing, export and end use, there are vast amounts of methane and other greenhouse gases leaked into the atmosphere, which is contributing to climate change. On the extraction side of the frack cycle, um, total production would release 55 billion tons of carbon dioxide from the Permian Basin by 2050. And as I mentioned earlier, fracking companies are over drilling. This results in excessive burning of gas in the Permian Basin, releasing even more methane and toxins into the air. Um, the Permian Basin is what we consider a climate bomb. And then on the export side of the frack cycle, frack, frack cycle the three fracked gas export terminals in the Rio Grande Valley alone would release about 9.2 million tons of greenhouse gases per year. And when you add up all of these emissions, uh, the emissions from exporting overseas, the projects all together, all three, would have the equivalent climate impacts of 61 coal-fired power plants per year. And this is why we are mobilizing on the ground with communities abroad to break the frack cycle and we are campaigning to stop the cycle at every point, from extraction, transmission, to processing, to export, and import and end use. In the Rio Grande Valley, the fracked gas projects would pave over thousands of acres of pristine lands. They plan to construct in the middle of an international wildlife corridor. That's important for the endangered ocelot and aplomato falcon. And as of 2015, there were only 53 ocelots left in Texas and most of them in the Rio Grande Valley. In other parts of the Gulf Coast, construction and operations of oil and gas export terminals, and of course, the potential for dangerous oil spills would threaten pockets of remaining habitat for the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, migratory birds, Texas tortoise, and many other species. And just a reminder that Gulf Coast communities, we rely on a thriving ecosystem to survive. Uh, indigenous rights violation. Fossil fuel companies, regulators, and banks have not consulted with tribes like the Carizo, Come Crudo, or the Estocna in Texas about construction and operation on sacred sites in their homelands. For example, Texas LNG, which is one of the proposed projects in the Rio Grande Valley, plans to build their massive complex on top of a national historic registered site called Garcia Pasture. The site contains the remains of a pre-Columbian indigenous burial site and village. And here's a quote from Juan Mancias, the chairman of the Carizo Comacurudo tribe, uh, the original people of our region. And he says, we ask that they stop ignoring the native original people of Texas's pleas and to protect our sacred lifeways and sacred sites. The Carizo Comacrudo tribe have been resisting fossil fuel colonization across the state. 
Juan Montes and I even traveled to Paris, France several years ago alongside other community leaders to confront banks uh, supporting fracking in Texas. And our trip resulted in amazing bank divestment victory that I'll touch on later. And here's a photo of Juan Mancias and two other leaders holding up a banner. Um, they're standing in front of a pipeline construction site and the banner says, human remains are human, respect them. Local economy, dolphin watch tours, birding, outdoor recreation, fishing and beach tourism. That is the lifeblood of many Texas coastal communities. In the Rio Grande Valley, the Laguna Atascosa Wildlife Refuge, um, that would be the most impacted by the fracked gas exports, brings in about $14 million annually. And there's a group uh, in our region called the Fishermen and Shrimpers of the RGV that's currently challenging the permits for the projects because the industry would completely devastate their local family businesses. And as they say, uh, these shrimpers, that the shrimp lay and hatch their eggs in the sh ship channel where the industry would spew pollutants. And if the shrimp are dead in the ship channel, business would be dead out in the bay. Community opposition. There is tremendous opposition to the fracked gas terminals in the valley and along other parts of the Gulf Coast where other projects are proposed. And opposition to fracked gas pipelines and infrastructure is just gaining momentum nationally and internationally. Regulators like the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the FERC, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, TCEQ, the Maritime Administration, MIRAD, and other agencies and decision makers like the county commissioners have been receiving thousands of comments opposing these terminal projects. And to make their opposition known and understood, several coastal cities have passed anti-LNG city resolutions. A school district even voted down what's called Chapter 313, a tax handout in Texas, for uh, two of the LNG export terminal projects in hopes that these less subsidies for the projects would kill them. And projects are currently facing a bunch of legal challenges from these cities, from environmental organizations and local residents. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, these movements are gaining momentum internationally. Texas communities are resisting exports, uh, are connecting with communities overseas in Ireland, France, and across Europe. These potential customers of the gas don't want the new import terminals and they don't want to increase their dependency on fracked oil and gas. These partnerships with Friends of the Earth France and cross-pollination with communities has led to amazing victories. Recently, the French company Engie walked away from a $7 billion contract that would have imported gas to France for 20 years um, from the proposed Rio Grande LNG terminal in our community. And also, the Irish government has recently rejected permits for a project called Shannon LNG that would have imported gas from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and their new Irish government has pledged to commit to moving away from gas imports. So if we continue to pressure them to stick with their commitments, uh, we could stop Ireland from building what's called cork LNG that would import gas from Rio Grande LNG in South Texas. And these international partnerships with groups like Friends of the Earth France, I mentioned, Rainforest Action Network, they're doing incredible work to also divest international banks from supporting these projects. And this has resulted in a major uh, victory. Uh, French bank BNP Paribas has dropped the Texas LNG project. And there are several other banks that aren't currently involved with these projects, but have a history, a track record of being involved with fossil fuel projects, but they've committed to staying away from uh, LNG in South Texas. Thank you for uh, hearing my presentation and you know, please let me know if, if uh, anyone from the audience has questions. Thank you. Questions in your chat? Well, I just thought that's amazing to hear about the way you all are going after the entire frack cycle um, and opposing it every single place you get a chance to intervene 
And it, obviously you're getting a lot of popular and community support. So thank you. And we're gonna turn it over now for uh, Sarah Thomas, who's gonna talk about um, going after the industry's big giant plans um, around petrochemicals and plastics. Thanks so much, Rick. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can see that. So thanks everyone. I'm Sarah Thomas with the Funder Collaborative on Oil and Gas. And I'd like to thank Rick for organizing and moderating the panel. And thank you to everyone at Bioneers for hosting such a seamless virtual event. So I'd like to pick up where Becca left off to talk about why her efforts and the efforts of other organizers around the country are so critical. But to fully understand the importance of these local fights, we need to step back a bit and look at the larger national picture of US climate efforts, and specifically this paradox that exists in how the US is approaching climate. On the one hand, the US is starting to make real progress on clean energy. Local communities, states, and the private sector are advancing innovations in electricity, transportation, and even now in the building sector by electrifying buildings. Unfortunately, there's another aspect to the US role in climate, and it's one that some decision makers and even the climate community has been slow to tackle. And that is the U.S. role as a major producer of oil and gas. So at the same time that the U.S. is making strides on reducing demand for oil and gas, the country is producing more and more of it. In fact, the U.S. has become the largest producer of oil, natural gas, and gas liquids in the world. That's right. The U.S. now produces more oil than Saudi Arabia, more gas than Russia, and more gas liquids than Saudi Arabia or China. And if projections are correct, the U.S. will continue to be a major producer. So this graph shows current and projected U.S. oil and oil production. You can see that U.S. is at the top globally and is projected to be at least for the next couple of decades. Likewise, the U.S. is the largest producer of gas, of dry gas. Um, as you can see here, it, it surpasses Russia and is also projected to be the leading producer out until 2040. The reason for that is the shale boom, which was launched by hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. And this is the reason that the US has now become the, produce, the production giant that it is today. So just to give you a sense of where this production is incurring. So in terms of onshore crude oil production, you can see that a large amount is coming from the Southwest of Texas and Eastern New Mexico, including the Permian Basin, which, Rebecca, which Becca spoke about. The dry gas production um, is by and large coming from the east, particularly the Ohio Valley and the Utica and Marcella Shell formations. So if we're talking about a toxic tap, it's probably fair to say that in the US, it's turned on to high. To further complicate matters, Advancing clean energy and low cost alternatives to oil and gas, as important as they are, and they are really critical efforts, they are probably not enough to slow down the tap. And the reason is because industry, as Rick said, is working on ensuring ongoing market demand for US oil and gas globally. With stagnating prices and low profit margins, industry is looking to build markets abroad in two primary ways first by exporting oil and gas through liquefied natural gas, and second by converting oil and gas liquids into petrochemicals. So fertilizer, methanol, and especially plastics. So we can see this because over the past several years, there's been proposals for a massive amount of new oil and gas facilities to export oil and gas and to convert it into petrochemicals. As of November 30, 30th of this year, the Environmental Integrity Project, which is tracking these projects, identified 328 projects that have been permitted since 2012, and another 60 that are in the process of requesting permits. So this map is from EIP, and it shows the amount and distribution of many of these facilities. As you can see, a large portion of them are slated for the Gulf Coast of Texas and Louisiana and the Ohio Valley, although there are projects slated for other places as well. 
And just to note, these are just the projects that are in the permitting phase. There are additional proposals that have not yet reached that point. So what does this mean for the climate? Well, maybe not surprisingly, it is not good news. Because on their own, these are major industrial facilities that result in significant on-site emissions. According to a recent article in Environmental Research Letters, the build out of proposed petrochemical plants, LNG export terminals, refineries, just along the um, US Gulf Coast and the Southwest could generate as much as one half a billion tons of additional greenhouse gas emissions per year by 2030. So that's the equivalent emissions of 131 coal fired power plants. And that's again, just the on-site emissions. There's also the emissions from ongoing production by one estimate from Oil Change International, as, me, as much as 120 billion metric tons of new greenhouse gases, that's the equivalent of a thousand coal-fired power plants, could be released by 2050 if the US is to drill into its oil and gas reserves. The second major concern around climate is carbon lock-in. These facilities are billion dollar projects. They're huge assets. So if industry is successful in pushing forward the construction of this infrastructure, they may lock in emissions from these facilities and make the global transition away from oil and gas to renewables more difficult. But it's not just a climate problem, as Becca suggested. It's also a social and racial justice problem because these facilities don't just release greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. They also release criteria pollutants like volatile organic compounds and particulate matter, as well as other toxic pollutants like benzene. And many of these facilities are located and slated for production in communities of color, communities that have already been disproportionately burdened with existing industrial facilities and with the associated health impacts. So let's zoom in now to Southern Louisiana along the 85 mile stretch of the Mississippi River between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, known as Cancer Alley. This area already is home to over, well, about 150 existing oil, gas, and petrochemical facilities. And it's also home to seven out of the 10 census tracts with the highest cancer risk in the country. And it's the site of many new proposed facilities. So if we zoom in even more to where about where that red box is, we get to St. James Parish, Louisiana. And here's a map with the existing industrial facilities as well as new proposed oil and gas infrastructure. Just one of these projects, Formosa Plastics, which is on the left-hand side of the, of the screen, would release 13 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. And it would also double the toxic pollutants released in St. Many of these toxic pollutants would fall disproportionately on communities of color. And the reason is because in 2014, there was a land use zone change in St. James Parish, which prioritized industrial facilities in two districts, di districts that have a high percentage of African-American residents. So beyond the climate impacts of these facilities, there are often very clear environmental justice impacts as well. But there are reasons to think that these unnecessary projects can be slowed or stopped. The first reason is because of the finances. Many of the industrial facilities are on shaky financial ground. Certainly the oil price collapse and the economic downturn associated with COVID-19 is part of the reason, but it's not all of it. For one, fracking is by and large not a profitable industry. There have been numerous reports um, recently detailing that oil and gas have very marginal profit margins and high debt loads. And the report suggests that industry as a whole is in structural decline. Second, many of these large infrastructure projects are also financially precarious and rely on the investments of a few big investors that can be swayed. So just from a numbers perspective, many of these projects don't make sense. And that is an angle being pursued with decision makers and investors. But in addition to the investments, many of these projects require local, state, and federal permits. And it's possible to challenge projects at each of these stages. The Wan Ha, the proposed Wan Ha chemical facility, which is towards the right-hand side of the screen, it was actually canceled 
not being able to receive a local permit in St. James Parish. So the precarious financial state of these projects make the work that Becca and other organizers around the country do even more important. The work of these organizers help to delay unnecessary projects and buy time for the market fundamentals to shift even more and for green alternatives to take an even stronger hold. So far um, in, the, in the US over the last couple of years, these efforts have um, yielded tremendous results. As I mentioned, just looking back at the map of, Juan, of St. James Parish, Juan Ha was canceled after a failure to get local permits. And for most of plastics, in very recent news, um, we learned that a final investment decision has been delayed um, indefinitely as a result of court victories and the tremendous local opposition to it. These moves um, mirror trends in other places where pipelines and other facilities are being canceled or, or are at risk of cancellation due to investors pulling out and or permit challenges. So these are all approaches that are the focus of the Funder Collaborative on Oil and Gas. The Funder Collaborative launched two years ago and holds the core belief that addressing the U.S. role in the climate crisis means advancing clean energy and the U.S. role as a major producer of oil and gas. So in practice, that means supporting through pooled funding and aligned funding a range of efforts, including very local granular organizing and communication efforts, such as community groups like St. James, Rise St. James. And it also means funding a range of financial, technical, and legal analytical work to resist projects. We work with local and state partners and regional funders in regions of the country of special significance to oil and gas. And this includes not just groups focused on climate, but those working on environmental justice, public health, economic development and economic diversification. And on this last point, I would just say that we don't think it's enough just to shift the US role on oil and gas. It's imperative to recognize and to address the economic and fiscal impacts of the transition away from oil and gas, especially for very local and frontline communities. So I'll close with a note of optimism. And that is that local communities and advocates are succeeding in their efforts to pave a new way, resisting projects while simultaneously looking for ways to bring in new jobs and taxes. So while clean energy is important, and it is, we also need to focus on turning off the toxic tap. And in the US, that means investing in folks at the local level, folks like these that came together along the Columbia River and those that came together in, in Louisiana. Folks that are coming together not only to fight specific projects, but also to build a movement focused on an economically sound and equitable transition away from fossil fuels. Thanks very much. Fantastic, Sarah. Thank you so much for that big overview. And um, what we're going to um, do now is we're going to shift. I am going to impersonate or take on the persona of uh, the Center for Climate Integrity. Um, so I'm going to represent them today. I've been working closely with them for a number of years. Um, and uh, they asked me to present their work to you. So I am going to, and then afterwards, we'll take questions for all of our panelists. So if you've got a question, make sure to put it in the chat um, and we'll go from there. So uh, let me try to share my screen here. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about a program that's aimed at a different level than um, what we've heard about from Becca and Sarah. We're going directly after uh, the political and economic influence of big oil and gas. So these aren't on the ground fights for particular plants. These play back way upstream at the level of the industry overall. Um, now you all are familiar, I'm sure with this arrow on the left, that's the global scientific consensus of what we have to do in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and 2050. That 2030, that 45% reduction, that's a huge lift. You may not be familiar with the arrow on the right. The arrow on the right is what Exxon is promising Wall Street they're going to do by 2030. And what's really obvious when you look at that is that both of those two things can't be true. 
and Exxon and all the rest of big oil is going to do everything in their power not to disappoint Wall Street, regardless of the global consequences. Um, so this is a headline uh, that was published just a couple of weeks after our recent election. And the reporter went and talked to Republican leadership. And basically that uh, headline shows you that in terms of Republicans, they're united in promoting Exxon's agenda. Um, and in a nutshell, that explains why even though we're flush with solutions to take on climate change, we still don't have sweeping climate policy. And that's been, this has been the loggerheads we have been at for over a decade. And so the question becomes, how do you deal with that? How do you work around this sort of alliance between the fossil fuel industry and um, mostly Republicans, frankly? And I have got some good news in that regard. And that this was not possible just literally five years ago, but just in 2015, thanks to some work of dogged investigative reporters, internal oil industry documents from Exxon, from Shell and others came to light. And it showed that as early as the, these, these documents show that as early as the 1960s, these companies knew that their products, when they were used as intended, would cause terrible harm. And our goal, the goal of this project at the Center um, for Climate Integrity is nothing short of using those internal documents to lay the blame of the climate crisis where it belongs, at the feet of big oil. So I'm gonna take a minute just to show you a few of the documents. There are reams of these things. They're all being, uh, they've been put together and put in court filings. I'm just gonna show you just a few and I'll bring your attention to the um, highlighted sections on the, on, on the right there. These are Exxon internal company documents from their scientists. The two things to notice is that they are saying clearly back in 1978, CO2 is causing, is causing climate change. And secondly, that CO2 is coming from the burning of fossil fuels. So this is 1978, no doubt about it in their mind. And they kept uh, their research going. This is internal company research they were doing. And by 1980, 81, 82, their scientists were beginning to ponder the consequences of this increased level of CO2 in the atmosphere. And they came to some startling conclusions. And in these internal documents, they don't mince words. They say that by 2030, if, if we remain, if the world remained um, reliant on fossil fuels for its energy source, that we would have catastrophic effects for a substantial portion of the world's population, including what we're seeing now, coastal flooding, serious impacts on global food production due to droughts, bigger, more powerful storms. Those were their conclusions. Essentially, unless we move away from fossil fuels, there would be catastrophic consequences on a global scale. So that's again, 1982. Um, and I wanna show you one other thing. Just last year, the Center for Climate Integrity organized the first ever congressional hearings on oil industry deception. And in those hearings, they put up um, AOC, who's on that committee, put up a chart and you can see her, her question there, um, which got over a million and a half views on Twitter. She posted her little um, question session. But basically what this chart shows is that in 1982, Exxon predicted the global temperature and the global uh, parts per million of CO2. And they were exactly perfectly uh, spot on. So uh, from 1982 to, um, to uh, 2019, what this demonstrates is that Exxon didn't just know about CO2 and climate change. They were literally the world's leading experts at that time about the relationship of the uh, atmospheric CO2 and the impact that would have on our climate. But of course, knowing isn't a crime. Knowing is not a crime. It's what they did next that was a crime. 
What they did is they decided to cover up what they knew. And in legal terms, when you cover up what you know and what you know is, is, is harmful, that's called fraud. They decided to commit fraud. And they went on, this is this uh, uh, statement from their CEO is typical of what all the CEOs of oil companies were saying in, in the 90s and on up into the um, 2000s. But they didn't stop there. As you know, they went on for 30 years. They hired PR firms and front groups and paid scientists to come up with phony research to question uh, the connection between burning fossil fuels, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and climate change, all in the service of being able to keep drilling, pumping and selling as much oil as possible. And they didn't just stop there with sort of bald lies and trying to confuse the science. They did things that were incredibly clever. And I'm guessing some of you have seen this, know your carbon footprint. This in terms of, if you were a, a magician, in, in terms of magician's terms, this is called misdirection. They don't want you to think about their contribution to climate change and what they knew and hid. They want you to think about your contribution, calculate your emissions, Make your pledge, tell everybody what you've done in terms of your contribution to climate change. And the amazing thing about this stuff is how well it actually worked. You know, the, 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 um, um, uh, we did a poll just in the last year and we asked folks the simple question, who is the most to blame for global warming? And what you can see there is that, hey, basically two thirds of people think, hey, all of us equally share in the blame. All of us equally share in that blame. Our carbon footprint is all bad. We all fly, we're to blame. Big oil companies, only about 15% of Democrats and 10% of everybody else said those are the people to blame. That's how successful uh, these, these folks is. Disinformation, misinformation uh, campaign has been. But, um, but good news is because of all these internal documents, we have a, a program that basically has just two things that we need to do to take the oil and gas industry and to wreck its economics and to spoil its social license. Those two things are to file cases in court. As you just saw, you could say anything you want, like Trump was saying anything he wanted about fraud, elections and fraud, but in front of a judge, those things don't stand up. And it's the same thing with big oil. You get them in front of a courtroom and in front of a judge and a jury, they have to tell the truth. They can't lie and the evidence against them is truly um, overwhelming and their liability amounts to trillions of dollars enough to change the economics of the whole oil and gas industry. And secondly, the second element is to use the narrative that's embedded in those cases, that big oil and new, and they lied to destroy their social license. In other words, to turn big oil in the public's mind into big tobacco. In the same way big tobacco knew their products caused cancer and they lied about it, it's the same with big oil and climate change. So those are the two program elements. Um, let me just unpack it a little bit for you. This idea of encouraging and supporting cases. Who is suing? Who is suing? It's not individuals. It's cities, counties, and states. And that's important to understand that it's not individuals. These are public elected officials, mayors and city councils and state attorneys general who decide to file cases. And there are now 24 cases um, before the courts, including six attorneys general. And it's growing. This is growing um, every year. We expect a whole bunch more in 2021. Now, why are these folks deciding to file cases? Because they care about climate change? Well, of course they do, but they're really deciding to file because these um, impacts of climate change are budget busters for states. This little chart here just shows you coastal states and it's just to protect from flooding. As you know, there are many other consequences of climate change, whether it's wildfires or massive rains. Um, this is coastal flooding, mostly to protect from high tides. So if you just look at this, 
um, um, North Carolina, for example, you see there, that figure there for, for protecting their coast from high tides. Well, North Carolina's whole annual budget for their state is just $24 billion. Maryland's whole annual budget is $18.8 billion. That's for everything. Education, public safety, public parks, environmental protection. Yet they're facing these kind of costs just to protect their coasts from um, the, the rising uh, tides uh, of climate change from the uh, ocean, rising oceans. So that's why um, folks are joining these suits and open to joining them. And interestingly enough, if the oil companies aren't sued, these costs entirely fall on taxpayers. And so that's the real um, grassroots strategy is you basically, in essence, simply pose the question in the same way that the lawyers do in court. They say, who should pay these enormous costs? Should it be the climate polluters who knowingly cause the problem or should it be taxpayers? Should taxpayers pick up the bill? And when you frame it that way, we're finding that it has a lot of political salience. Uh, and by the way, we've done a lot of polling, CCI has, and making polluters pay for climate related damages is incredibly popular. After folks hear that deception story that the uh, oil industry knew and lied, there you have three quarters of voters who want to hold them accountable and have them be sued and pay for the damages. And I'll break that down for you a little bit. It goes across the board. It's completely bipartisan. There is no climate story to protect the climate that is as bipartisan as this. You've got 73% of Republicans saying, yes, sue the oil companies for climate damages. 91% of, of um, Democrats are saying it. So when you've got something that's as politically popular as that, you're able to go um, to elected officials across the country. Uh, CCI's organizers share uh, cost data with elected officials. They share this polling data showing how uh, popular it is. And then they educate them on their uh, ways that they could do cost recovery. And that's how these more cases are happening because again, they're being filed by elected officials. Um, this map here just shows how the cases are growing. It literally, two and a half years ago, there were zero cases. Now, as I said, there's 24. They're spread across the country in these different uh, court districts. And those cases were chosen very specifically. They were strategically filed in cases that had high climate damages. The um, state laws for these kinds of damages were strong and the states had good Supreme Courts that you wouldn't uh, file a case and have it work its way up to the Supreme Court of that state and only to be overturned. So all that has been um, legal research that's been done. And these cases um, are growing as, as, as we speak every, every single day. I, I'm not at liberty to say, but two more cases will be filed, we think, in the next uh, month. Now, the industry is trying every way it can to stop these cases from going to trial, to get them thrown out. So far, they're, they're on procedural matters. They're not getting to the merits of the case yet. We haven't been able to present the information yet to a jury, but you have, they have been able to present it to judges. And in every single time, the industry's various tactics to get these thrown out of court, they have failed every single time. And I put this ruling up here. This is the state of Rhode Island AG versus Chevron and about 20 something other fossil fuel companies. This judge, William Smith, he's a Republican ju uh, 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 judge that was appointed by George Bush. So a Republican judge wrote this. And I'm just going to read it out loud because I want you to imagine you're in the boardroom of Chevron and you're reading this. The second paragraph, defendants understood the consequences of their activity decades ago when transitioning from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy would have saved a world of trouble. But instead of sounding the alarm, defendants went out of their way to becloud the emerging scientific consensus and further delay changes, however existentially necessary, that would in any way interfere with their multi-billion dollar profits. That's written by a Republican judge. 
You can imagine when that was read or uh, understood and and presented to the board of Chevron, to the board of Exxon, all these various oil companies that were being sued, that caused their heads to explode. That's their their, uh, liability that they're facing. Going to trial is literally the oil industry's worst nightmare. And the press is really starting to pay attention to this. Everywhere where their cases were getting press, over 500 stories in the past year alone, a CCI has helped to generate. And the great thing about that press is basically it's like, wait a minute, oil companies are being sued? Well, what are they being sued for? Oh, for knowing and lying about climate change? Well, how much? Wow, it's for billions of dollars because if they don't pay those billions of dollars, that's going to be on taxpayers. So it's just this incredible uh, political um, uh, uh, benefit these cases uh, uh, afford local organizers. Every place where their cases, CCI makes regrants to local organizers to try to put this idea of polluter pays on the map. So the PR effort really is as important as the cases. Now, when you have something in political terms where you've got something that's politically popular, you can show in the polls it's politically popular. You can show that the press, you're getting a lot of press coverage and you can also show that these cases really are substantive. You can make a lot of political hay with that. So I'm just gonna show you right now um, a video um, and it'll speak for itself. I'm speaking from Delaware. We're the lowest lying state in the nation relative to sea level. For just last week, Delaware State Attorney General sued 31, 31 big fossil fuel companies, alleging that they knowingly wrecked havoc and damage on climate, our climate. Damage that is plain for everyone to see but the president. So um, believe it or not, Trump's Department of Justice would show up in court and plead on behalf of the fossil fuel industries to get these uh, cases thrown out of court. With uh, Biden's Department of Justice, that's gonna all go away. We have every assurance from the Biden uh, folks that they will be supporting these cases, filing friendly briefs with the court, saying that these should go to trial, they should not be thrown out, et cetera. So that's a, a really positive um, uh, the first really positive thing that we see from the Biden administration in terms of climate, I think there'll be a lot more. Uh, now, our challenge, though, so I've, I basically laid this out to you. Our challenge is that when people understand the costs, they realize, oh, if I, if big oil doesn't pay those, taxpayers, I have to pay those. So we've got to get that point across somehow, and we're doing that um, using advertising. So let me show you one other video. This is an example of a video we used in Texas. We ran on social media trying to see if we could increase people's awareness of the costs that they face around climate change. I want to talk to you today about what's going on in Texas. As I'm sure you know, climate change is creating a lot of issues. Whenever it storms, Texas is getting bigger and bigger floods. And we have a plan to fix all this damage caused by big oil companies. Okay. All Texans are going to pay. Are you being serious right now? So, your share is $7,717. Um, well, I don't really have $7,000. Oh no. Hell no. That'd be ridiculous. So those kind of ads, we're able to personalize those. Again, you take the climate damages, you calculate those, you divide them by the number of people and you come up with a number. And then you can run ads um, on social media targeted to very specific audiences. And that's one of the tools in the toolbox that we give the organizers that are trying to put polluter pays on the map in various places. But that doesn't, those kind of ads don't get at the question of deception. The oil industry knew and lied. And we know from our research, our public opinion research, that the knowing and lying is essential for people to know. So this is a uh, this is another. Um, I want to talk to you today about what's going on. Next one. There we go. This is another ad that we ran. um, And this ran, uh, I think about 5 million people saw this ad during the latest election. Um, And so I'll show you this now. Have you noticed that the world's on fire? Record heat waves? Does that worry you? 
Well, it should, because this climate thing is your problem. And at Big Oil, we've made sure it's not ours. Forty years ago, when our own scientists predicted that burning fossil fuels could lead to catastrophic effects, we spent billions to sweep it under the rug. No one needs to know that. We gave money to PR firms, marketers, invested in political campaigns. A lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. Love that guy. Today, he's helping us do even more, rolling back all those fossil fuel regulations. At Big Oil, we're going to be fine. But you might want to start a compost pile or stop exhaling so much carbon dioxide. You got a lot of work to do because your kids are going to need it. <laughs> Here's to you, President Trump. All of this was a Okay, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna close by summing up. Our goal is simple. We wanna make big oil into the villains of climate change. And every time, but what that means is every time you see a climate catastrophe on the news, we want people to think, huh, big oil did that. Big oil is to blame for that. Then if that, once we succeed at doing that, you won't see a headline like the one I showed you before. Republicans oppose any policy to reduce fossil fuel use any more than you'd see a headline that says Republicans oppose any policy that reduces cigarette use or opioid use or asbestos use. We will have branded them as a completely toxic industry because of what they did, what they did and the, what they lied about. And at the same time in court, we'll be uh, trying to tag them with trillions of dollars in damages to knock their um, economic uh, power. So their political and economic power. We do that, we'll remove the single biggest obstacle to sweeping climate legislation, uh, the big oil industry. And with that, um, I am done. I'm gonna now take um, questions from folks. And um, we'll start with um, a, for a question on um, Formosa Plastics. So the question is, Formosa Plastics is a Japanese company, um, the questioner says. Is there a preemptive effort citizens can do to fight against multinationals to create um, sacrifice zones in American communities of color before they are cited? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I think that the term sacrifice zone really captures it well when you look at these communities and what they're facing. It depends a lot on the politics of a location. So there are efforts, for instance, Washington State right now at a local county level to have moratoriums with the eventual goal of bans on new or expanded fossil fuel infrastructure. Obviously, the politics in Washington around Seattle are quite different than in Louisiana. Um, and so it's a little bit more difficult to be preemptive in that regard. But I think that the fracked cycle that, that Becca spoke about and those efforts to try to connect with investors and talk about the impacts and, are an um, important step. Becca, um, any thoughts from you about this that, that kind of question? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're uh, campaigning throughout every part of the frac cycle, um, you know, working with communities uh, facing the in uh, extraction of fracking, uh, the transmission of fracked oil and gas through pipelines, uh, exports, um, import terminals, uh, the flow of capital and, um, uh, you know, any investments. Um, and I think, you know, that's uh, that's really how we have to approach um, dismantling uh, the fossil fuel industry is by campaigning to break it along the cycle. And Becca, are you finding a, a particular place in that cycle where folks are gaining more traction than other places um, or, or places that you feel like are particularly vulnerable right now? Uh, definitely. I think um, uh, fighting import terminals and export terminals, uh, especially in Texas. Uh, in Texas, a lot of the pipelines that are just proposed in, in the state uh, fall under only Texas uh, regulatory agencies, which are largely rubber stamp agencies. They have little to no regulatory process. Um, 
So, you know, uh, export terminals uh, do fall under the Maritime Administration, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, federal regulators that have uh, more of a regulatory process, more opportunities uh, for communities on the ground to challenge mm -hmm. uh, that process. But that's not to say, um, you know, it's still important that we look at these pipelines and we are supporting communities, um, you know, resisting extraction and transmission via pipeline throughout the state. Um, but there, you know, there are a lot less regulatory bodies to pressure. And that's why it's important to connect these fights uh, and to think about, um, you know, who are other targets? Are they, are they banks? Um, and not just relying on regulators. You know, is it the customers overseas? Is it, you know, other companies that want to support these projects? Um, and, and I call it death by death by a thousand cuts. Uh, it's just mapping out all the targets and, you know, figuring out um, where we can pressure and, and get in between and uh, stop this infrastructure from from growing. That's right. well, and I think you, sh you know, you shared um, and, and Sarah, Sarah um, basically said these companies are financially shaky. And so if you can basically any time you can slow things down, time, as they say, time is money and you make uh, you, you increase the odds of a project is not viable. Sarah, I'm curious, you ended on like an optimistic note, but I've heard that you all have had some really big victories multi billion stopping multi-billion dollar projects um, just in the past uh, year. I wonder if you could tell us about one or one of those. Sure. I mean, and there, there are actually a fair amount to choose from. Um, the one that I might um, mention really is kind of Formosa Plastics, which is just, I'll go back to that. There are a number to choose from, but it's just, it was a just significant project. As I mentioned, it was going to double toxic pollutants in St. James Parish. It was going to be one of the largest major new sources of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. and had a lot of momentum behind it. But thanks to the really dogged efforts of lo very, very local groups like Rye St. James, um, some dedicated lawyers um, that have fought some of these permits, they really have created so much uncertainty around the project and, and public opposition, particularly in the wake of the George Floyd, the death of George Floyd and the increasing attention in the country to structural racism, to be able to shine the light on how it's black Americans that are being disproportionately affected and would be in the case of Formosa um, and have really done an amazing job. And as a result, um, the project is not you know, officially canceled, but an investment decision on it has been indefinitely delayed. We're, as I, as I mentioned, we're seeing kind of similar types of situations in other parts of the country. Um, the Wan Ha chemical facility, as I mentioned, that was canceled. The Atlantic Coast pipeline um, essentially was canceled, attributed to the project's high cost. There's a major um, chemical complex in um, the Ohio Valley where two of the major investors have now withdrawn because of kind of analyses showing the finances and the economic potential wasn't as strong as maybe the company had suggested. So a number of good, um, I think, signs in the right direction. And the truth is the economics are just gonna be more and more on the side of renewable energy and alternatives. And so the work that Beck and others do, do to delay these projects is, is a good thing. That's great. Um, I'm going to uh, take a question. Someone said, hey, uh, you know, how do you counter the argument? And this is a one for me. Uh, how do you counter the argument that if you go after these companies and you sue them, you make them pay, that they'll just raise the price of gas and that people, you know, have to use their cars? And I, that's such an interesting argument. We did focus groups on that argument. And people realized these were focus groups of conservative um, um, Republicans in the South and in the Midwest. And we raised that issue. And people's responses was fascinating. They said, look, oil and gas prices, they go up and down all the time. But tax increases never go away. You get a tax increase, which is really what we're talking about. Either they pay or we pay. You get a tax increase, it's there forever. And so basically that's the real, the real answer is, it's not an either or. It's somebody's got to pay for all this infrastructure. And uh, the oil companies are going to say they're going to increase the price of gas and they might be able to get away with it. But you reduce their uh, 
political and economic power, we're going to have alternatives. That's why we say they're responsible for the climate crisis. I, I think I, I'll give one uh, uh, orthogonal example. You know, back in the right about the time when everybody was starting to talk about climate change in the, in the, in the early 90s, we were talking about a hole in the ozone layer. And global scientists determined it was coming from uh, chlorofluorocarbons. And my, well, you know, it, 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 and the industry that produced those didn't do what big oil did. It didn't uh, try to hide the evidence. Instead, everybody got together, figured out, the scientists, the industry, and the government got together, figured out how to solve it. And the ozone layer, the ozone hole has shrunk smaller and smaller and smaller because of this global treaty. That's what could have happened with fossil fuels. We knew it was a problem, the industry knew, and instead of owning up to it and working with the government and moving us away from fossil fuels, instead they hid it and tried to sell as many fossil fuels and make the entire society as dependent on fossil fuels as possible. So that's why we say that the crisis belongs at their feet and um, you know, raising, they're, they're gonna claim they'll raise oil and gas prices. Let's, let's let the cards fall and see how that all plays out. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm curious, Becca, um, how you go about, um, if somebody wants to get involved in a campaign locally, how do they do that? Where are the entry points? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you can email me directly. Um, you can find us on social media. Um, the Cariso Como Crudo tribe has a social media page. Um, another Gulf is Possible, which is a collaborative I'm part of, um, you know, we have ways you can reach us online uh, and we connect with community members through uh, various different ways, phone banking, um, you know, block walking pre-COVID, um, uh, hosting public events, informational sessions, protests. Uh, we did something where we, we got a parade float during the largest international bicultural parade, uh, you know, in the city called Chato Days. And we had a, a no uh, LNG parade float right behind the LNG companies pro LNG parade float. Um, so, you know, we have all kinds of creative messaging and ways that we're constantly and consistently doing outreach uh, to our community about this issue. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and likewise, um, Sarah, I don't know if there are any um, foundations, philanthropists in the audience, but if folks wanted to get involved in the oil and gas collect, uh, collaborative, um, how do they do that? And what do you guys, um, you know, how often do you get together? Sure. So, um, so feel free to reach, reach out to me. Um, and I'm happy to share any materials. I think that one of the, in addition to kind of sh shining light on this issue for funders, the other real purpose that we try to serve is to connect funders with some of these very granular efforts. Um, of course, there's a role for the big environmental groups, but it's also really important to be supporting groups like Rise St. James, groups like Columbia Riverkeeper that are trying to stop these projects often when they're very, very early. So even before they've started the permit phase, and that can be a very effective time to try to resist projects. So we have developed a network across these regions of kind of advisors and working with some very small groups. And so we do our best to try to connect philanthropists kind of at any level that are interested in this issue, trying to connect them with groups that are consistent with their, um, their mission and their goals. That's fantastic. Um, a question from someone saying, uh, is there, if this is for anyone, uh, a good oil or plastics company? Rick, that might be for you. Ah, ha, ha. Well, I will say bioplastics, hooray. What's, what blows my mind, honestly, because we were looking at all this propaganda that, you know, oh, the oil and gas industry, that's like the basis of, of our freedom and, and America and our life. They brought us the good life. But if you think about it, fossil fuels is like the worst idea ever invented, right? All the plastics come from fossil fuels. We're just drowning in plastics and they want to make more and more and more climate change, right? It's just like... The, the level of global pollution. So I think the idea, I think there's no escaping. And the question is, how do you, uh, in my mind, at least the question is, how do you diminish the oil and gas industry's economic and political power enough to have the conversation we need to have? 
which is an orderly wind down of this industry and a wind up of the industries that are going to replace it. And that includes an uh, orderly wind down, includes thinking about the communities and the workers. Um, it's, you know, the whole, the whole, a whole cycle. But these folks, there, there is no future in my mind um, for the oil and gas industry as a fossil fuel industry. Because if you just look at the data in terms of climate, it, it can't, they, they don't, they can't coexist. Um, I don't know, did either one of you um, have anything you want to add or, or uh, elaborate on that? Okay. Um, reuse, and so I'm just looking at the uh, questions for a moment. Hmm. I would just turn it um, then back to any, any final thoughts, um, Sarah, that you'd like to offer? And then um, I'll ask you, Becca, and then I'll make a final uh, thought or two, and we'll, we'll be at time. Sure. I mean, again, I would just reiterate two things. And one is the, the importance of, of looking at the toxic tap. I think sometimes it's, it's easier to look at kind of green energy and all of this techno technological innovation. And of course, that's really important. But turning off the tap is equally important and is really critical given the U.S. role as a major producer. Um, and the other piece I would say is just the, the critical nature of economic diversification and revenue diversification, that's something that, that we're supporting and that we really believe in at the local and state level is that whether oil and gas likes it or not, the, the economics are changing and are moving against um, oil and gas and some of these projects. And we um, kind of collectively need to get ahead of that and really prepare school budgets, local budgets, um, jobs to, to make sure that that's, that we're moving in a direction that's um, economically sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. Fantastic, thank you. And on Becca, final thoughts? Um, thank you all for having me on this uh, panel presentation. Appreciate uh, learning from you all and the questions that we, re we received. Um, just my final thoughts, closing speech. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we need to invest um, you know, our time, energy, and people power into a just transition uh, away from a fossil fuel economy. So simultaneously, as we're you know, stopping new infrastructure, we need to be working together, uh, building networks um, for that transition, um, for a just transition. And um, I've been working with uh, people in my community in Brownsville. Uh, I'm looking forward to building networks of communities, um, continuing to build that internationally uh, and build that across the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's important that we cross-pollinate our movements uh, and grow uh, together. Um, and uh, I think, um, yes, yeah, just that we need to support a just transition um, thank you all so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think on that note, all, my, my, I just want to offer thanks to my fellow panelists for taking your Sunday to uh, prepare and, and to share your uh, work with the uh, Bioneers community. And I, I just feel like it's a very hopeful time, even though time is running out in terms of the climate, it's a hopeful time. We've never had the kind of mass movements. We've never had the economics go so much against this industry. And we've now got a new administration that uh, is open to a future that is a clean energy future for all of us and uh, future generations. So with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being with us. And um, that's it. Thank you.